with uh, great pleasure that I welcome Space Tech Move here to Google. Four years ago, I was just, uh, starting at university, and he was a Fulbright Scholar to the US, and he told me, young man, study computer science, so I'm happy to have him here at Google four years later. Thank you. And what Saeed will be talking about today is the next generation of all IP telecom networks and some of the uh, challenges and issues that come with what is really a very exciting development, especially for us here at Google. And this talk will be based on um, papers, several papers, um, one to IEEE uh, Letters on Communication, and also uh, his presentation recently actually uh, two or three days ago in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Conference. So uh, very excited to have him. And uh, let's see, oh, a couple more words. After uh, he was a Fulbright Scholar in the US, he was uh, a telecommunications uh, design engineer, do I have that right? At uh, Sprint Nextel. And he's currently a PhD candidate at the Technical University Carolo Wilhelmina of Braunschweig, Germany. Thank you very much, Adam. Actually, I have my mic here. Ah, then. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure for me to be among you today uh, to present my, uh, a, tut a tutorial talk that is based on my PhD research, um, based on a couple of papers, uh, communications, uh, IEEE Communications Magazine paper, and another recent paper that was presented in the IEEE CCNC conference that just took place last week. Uh, my name is Saeed Zagrul again, and this work is uh, based on, the collab uh, based on uh, my work with Professor Admila Yukan and uh, our collaboration with Dr. Wissam Al Ankar, from, uh, formerly with uh, Sprint Nextel and now with Booz Allen Hamilton. To give an idea about uh, our location in Germany and our group, uh, we're located here uh, in Braunschweig, um, uh, basically very near to Hanover, half an hour uh, away from Hanover and uh, about um, west of Berlin, about an hour and a half by the train. It's quite nice there and uh, there is a lot of history in Braunschweig, so uh, I uh, encourage everybody to go there and visit. Uh, the Institute of uh, Data Communications uh, and Networking actually uh, is uh, basically compo is composed of three major groups. The major groups that we have are the embedded systems group, the space communications group, and the networking group. The networking group where I work at is composed of two subgroups. One that is uh, optical control plane, uh, uh, one that's uh, interested in optical telecom uh, telecommunications research. Another one uh, that I work at is basically uh, concerned about 3G, 4G, uh, and mobility issues, uh, design and architecture. So, our today's presentation outline is actually uh, composed uh, simply of uh, the motivation, the background of this presentation, a uh, little bit about the next generation, uh, an example actually about next generation uh, IP multimedia subsystem uh, services, what's IMS, the big buzzword that is uh, taking place, you know, and we hear a lot about it, but, you know, I'm here to demystify it a little bit and point out some issues. I'm going to use an exemplary service actually to demystify IMS and point out some issues, and then talk about some architectural challenges uh, in, uh, in IMS. Uh, the architectural challenges that I'm going to be talking about are related to call setup delay, handoff management, and quality of service uh, uh, profile unification. A little bit uh, point out about each of these challenges. And then at the end of uh, my presentation today, I'm going to make some conclusions and point out you know, some future work and research. So, uh, um, the objective of today's uh, presentation is basically, as I just uh, mentioned, is to really investigate you know, um, the challenges and the deployments of next generation systems that are totally based on uh, the IMS platform. That is really a revolution, actually. Uh, from the current, uh, from the current or the traditional sense of uh, telecommunication networks, where you just have your uh, phone and just uh, you know make uh, 
dial a number and do call forwarding and, and have very simple services. The future is all about value added services, location based services, having some cool applications like actually I remember from my last, uh, my last conference uh, in Las Vegas last week, uh, the Nokia SVP was there and he was mentioning point and find applications where you could point your handset to some really nice site, for example, the Eiffel Tower, let's say, in Vegas, and you want the network, you want to get some information about that uh, Eiffel Tower, say, okay, I'm there, but I want to know a little bit more about the history of that thing. So I just uh, hit a button on my phone, and the phone will just get me out the wiki page about the, uh, the replica Eiffel Tower in Vegas. Of course, this involves more than just simple image processing. Maybe it needs to involve also the um, some location-based service, so the system doesn't like really miss it with uh, the real one, basically in Paris. So uh, things like these are basically quite like new, uh, non-traditional form of services that we are kind of looking at and imagining for the future. Our approach uh, for this research that I'm doing and. More, more or less focused on quality of service issues. The, the approach is mainly about, uh, we, because I worked uh, and collaborated with Sprint, so we're taking, the, as an example, the EVDO network uh, from Sprint, the cellular network, and basically looked at uh, the signaling that takes place in the network from an end-to-end -end perspective. So th that's what I'm going to be using. So all the references, all the naming conventions, even though in a large sense, in large picture, will apply to many other networks, uh, the, the terminology and the jargon that I'm going to use will be more or less taken and adopted from uh, the 3GPP2 or the EVDO network. Uh, the results that I'm going to show simply, uh, basically, we are going to be identifying some, uh, some issues and basically proposing some optimizations for how to make things better. So that's uh, uh, my approach today. So to make things, uh, to make things more like to, uh, just clear about the future trends um, uh, for, for the telecommunication networks. So the future trends actually uh, are based on, on basically from, uh, you ca we can look at it from two perspectives. The first perspective is really uh, the network architectural level, where people are looking at uh, higher bandwidths, basically. We want higher access rates. We want uh, different access technologies. We, we want to deploy certain, like, IP core in the network, and we want to reuse that core for, let's say, we want to have WiMAX, Wi-Fi, cellular networks, all connecting to the same core and reusing uh, the core over and over. We don't want to deploy a whole big set separate networks uh, uh, you know, uh, that are separated from each other. And we want more or less flatter plug and play architecture that will, fl uh, will just plug and play to that, uh, to that core. At the, from the service level, people are talking, as I just kept mentioning, IMS, IMS, which I'm going to explain like, uh, shortly. Uh, from the service perspective, people want to deploy that new architecture, this IP multimedia subsystem architecture. And, uh, and basically, th this architecture really allows third parties to get into play. It's just not designed for like big, uh, big providers and big telcos. B third party providers really mean like companies like Google who have like real high experience in basically making really consumer targeted applications, nice, uh, nice things like with uh, Google Maps, uh, location based services, uh, searching some, uh, pushing some specif uh, specific specific uh, advertising to, to the end user that really suits him. So it opens the door really wide open, away from standardization bodies, to the users, basically, to, uh, to, to the third parties to basically offer their uh, nice value-added services. So that's basically uh, what we mean uh, by this development in the service level, and that's quite important. And then really like, uh, we're, we're talking about richer multimedia session, having video, uh, online gaming, uh, all sorts of the, the applications that we all hear about in the media. So it's more about involving third parties, uh, having uh, richer sessions, and uh, having, uh, you know, like in, in, in enhancing the user end user's experience uh, about the network. So uh, the challenges uh, now that, are, uh, that we're going to be talking about actually today are simply uh, related uh, to the fact that as the telecommunication networks grow, telecommunication networks are not really simple networks. In fact, they are networks of networks, actually. To illustrate that fact, actually, before continuing with this slide, 
as we can see, in the past, in the old days, in the 90s and uh, uh, late 80s, people used like cellular networks just to make you know, a radio phone call, voice, end-to-end -end voice call. You know? And that was basically your base station and radio network controller managing multiple base stations, and that's it. There was no concept of internet connectivity over your handset, and things were simple. Afterwards, as this network evolved, we had this, um, the, we added the IP support to, uh, to basically the radio network. So we added uh, 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 the, the, the packet data serving node as the first IP gateway element, uh, supported by the home agent and the authentication authorization server to basically allow authentic authenticating and authorizing that session. Uh, PDSN and home agent really support your IP mobility. Basically, if you move between multiple uh, PDSN regions, uh, as I will show in this presentation shortly, uh, basically mobile IP will handle your mobility. So as you move, your session won't be interrupted you know because you will not change your IP address finally people recently like in the last few years really added they wanted to focus more it's not just simple IP connectivity it's not simple you know vo vo uh, you know just voice calls we want to focus more or less on the service itself we want to differentiate services and we want to have different third parties getting to play that's why people introduced the IMS the IMS includes multiple components I'm just gonna say the acronyms now and we're gonna look at each one of them uh, quickly uh, the first ones are basically the the proxy call session control function and the serving call session control function these are are simply proxy and uh, basically uh, uh, proxy and SIP registrar and uh, uh, servers. You're all probably familiar with uh, with SIP. And then uh, we have um, the home sub, uh, subscriber subsystem, which is basically the database, the the, the 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 part basically or the element that manages the user's profile or database. And then we have. Uh, basically the application servers where these application servers where basically the, the, the third parties can get into play and interact with the IMS uh, with, with the IMS network so through this application server you will be interacting with these elements to uh, to provide services to, to, the, to the end customers. So the IMS is simply an enabling framework for you guys, and then you deploy your services through using these applic SIP application servers, and the system will handle it for you down there. But the whole purpose of this presentation, why do we want to understand more about uh, the, the semantics of, uh, of, of the telecommunication network? You want to write application, you want to understand what's happening underneath because there are some specific things, uh, there is this mobility basically in, in, in the network and there are some specific things that you wanna be aware of. It's not just like a connected network, but it's more, it's, there are more dynamics in the network as we will see shortly. And there is the, at the end, there is this policy control and charging function, which we'll, we will focus a lot actually on. And this policy control and charging function will basically interact with these, uh, with, with the, with these two networks, the radio access network and the IP network, uh, transport network, to push and authorize for the use, uh, for the use of the services. So that's, uh, that's I guess, uh, a quite important box here to add. Okay. So uh, continue with the, with the challenges. As I mentioned, we are talking about uh, post-dial delay, uh, uh, the, the challenges that, that we're looking at. Post-dial delay is basically the time, the, the, the time that uh, when, whenever you dial your, uh, for, for a service in your handset, the time that it would take to, to establish this call, that's an, a very important uh, telecommunication network parameter that you don't want it to take too long time for you basically to, to, to acquire the service from the network. That's even more important for push to talk services. You don't want to wait for, for like a minute to, 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 to reach the other parties. The other thing is basically when you're moving uh, inside the network, as you hand off between areas, you don't want to have too much session interruption. Currently, it's about 70 milliseconds with, uh, with voice telecommunication networks. And with, more, with, uh, with IP networks, we're talking about second ra seconds ranges. And people are working on reducing that down to, that, you know, to the level uh, that, that we experience today in current wireless networks. 
There are multiple uh, design and challenges actually in, uh, in uh, challenges in, uh, in deploying the next generation networks. And these multiple design alternatives that we have in terms of these policy functions, we saw on the previous slide that we have a AAA server, authentication <coughs> authorization server, authorizing for this IP network, authorizing for this radio network. And we have this policy control and charging function authorizing from the service perspective. So we have two policy functions. And we are trying basically to minimize these conflicts basically in, in the roles of these uh, policy servers. So uh, what is IMS all about? I've, I've I kept talking IMS, IMS, IMS. So just to make it clear, uh, give a clearer definition of IMS, IMS is really a, an access agnostic framework. It doesn't really care. It's designed to be, not to care about the underlying network, whether it's wireless, whether it's cable, whether it's uh, cellular, cellular of whatever kind. It shouldn't really care much. The second thing is IMS really deviates from the common principle that we all followed in the past, which is actually quite strange. Uh, it was quite strange to me when I learned about it initially, like long time ago, that people really standardized even the services themselves. You'll have a standard from, uh, from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, that tells you how to do call forwarding to that level. They standardized each service by, by itself on its own. And to build a service, you have to go from uh, basically, from you have to build the routing functionality, you have to build security, you have to build everything. So it's a nightmare, actually, and we don't like that. So uh, to, to to avoid that, what we did is uh, w w uh, basically the intro introduce IMS to have a horizontal architecture where you just only focus on the service itself. So that's uh, avoiding this stovepipe, uh, the so-called stovepipe architecture. And then you want to inter uh, interwork more and more with other, uh, with other service platforms. Like uh, service platforms, there are already call forwarding functionalities that are already, uh, uh, and other functionalities in the, in the network like call parking, uh, call forwarding, etc. And these functionalities are already deployed. We don't want to throw them away. So we need to interact with them. And that's actually achieved by, through the use of these application servers. Uh, IMS is also an open pla uh, framework, mainly based on SIP and other frameworks like uh, H248 um, and Diameter Protocol for Authentication. And uh, it's, uh, the IMS, uh, needless to say, it will be deployed by most of the uh, major standards, like from uh, or major standardization bodies like the Third Generation Partnership Project, Third Generation Partnership Project 2, and WiMAX. To show a little bit about how the current uh, 3GP no networks are arranged, our handset is basically um, connected to a base station. The base station is managed by a radio network controller. The PDSN, the radio network controller's traffic, is forwarded to uh, the, the, the packet data serving node, uh, <coughs> the, to forwards your traffic and tunnels it. And the, packet, uh, uh, the PDSN basically is your first IP node. This is the first node that really talks IP. It's like your router, basically. And then through the interaction between the PDSN and the home agent, you get mobility. So if you move from one PDSN to another, you still connect to the same home agent, and then you have uh, mobile IP functionality. And then uh, the, the, the AAA really authenticates and authorizes uh, your connection. And it returns to the, to the network, to the PDSN and the RNC, your quality of service profile. This quality of service profile is completely transparent to, your use, uh, to, to, to the service that is being used. It doesn't understand whether it's a gaming application or a voice over IP application. It only, it only knows that you have a maximum amount of uh, uh, one megabits per second, let's say, uh, maximum aggregate bandwidth. Uh, you can do this, uh, these certain profiles, but really doesn't understand what's happening beyond that. So it's almost static. So uh, that's, that's the max that we, uh, we can do on a AAA. With some tr tweaks and tricks here and there, maybe you can get a little more, but it's not really aware of the service that is running. So the quality of service that we're talking about, this quality of service profile that is returned by the AAA to the PDSN is, will be enforced by the PDSN on the IP layer and by the radio network controller and the base stations from the RF perspective. So that's 
that's, that's how we really enforce uh, quality of service. So let's remember this, just to recap. AAA provides the quality of service profile and PDSN enforces it at the IP level and radio network controller and base stations enforces that at the radio level, simple. So we talked a little bit about uh, the, the three network tiers that, or the three networks, the radio access network, the IP transport network that included these elements, and now we're gonna look a little bit more about the IMS elements that I've been talking about. So the IMS elements that I talked about are these called session control functions, be it proxy or serving, uh, serving uh, call session control function here. And uh, the proxy function really does message verification, just like any SIP proxy uh, with extended functionality. It, 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 does, uh, ma it verifies the message whether it's, it's, it's correctly formatted or not. It, it, it generates accounting for that service and sends it to the, the AAA collection uh, for collecting that uh, billing traffic. And it authorizes and it interacts with the uh, policy control and charging function to authorize for that service. So, your, 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 your request simply go from uh, this, uh, th this handset, if you send a SIP request, your first entity that will interact with that SIP invitation request will be this PCSCF. And then it will pro if it's fine, it will be proxied through an interrogating CSCF. It's another layer to separate between domains, another SIP proxy. And then it will be proxied to your serving SCSCF or your SIP registrar. And it will be definitely authenticated through your home subscriber subsystem uh, for basically, de depending on your service profile. If you're requesting a service that you're not subscribed to, you will be rejected. If you want to deploy any value added services now, it will be deployed through this SIP application server here. For example, say that I want to, say in a parental control application that we're gonna see in a, in a, in a second, I want to say, let's say, that I want to restrict my child from making calls during school time, but only after school time. So what will happen is that once your invitation request or basically the, the, the call establishment request goes to the, uh, this uh, serving, uh, to, to, to your serving server here, it will, go, it will be routed through this SIP application server to figure out whether this is the correct time or not. If it's not the correct time, it will reject it. If it is the correct time, it will just let it through. So you can do any fancy things. For, for, from, uh, uh, we can have actually a lot more applications, like maybe this, uh, uh, you can deploy a lot more like location-based services. If you're in that location, you can, uh, you can allow certain things to happen. If you're in the school range, you can uh, only call your mom and maybe your teachers. If you're at home, you can call everybody. Any kinds of things. So, uh, after just to recap things and to put things in a in a in a in a, in a, in a bigger uh, in a bigger picture here, we see a whole call setup scenario, and this call setup scenario that we have includes uh, the three tiers that we just mentioned and the, the steps for making a simple call. The steps for making a simple call are basically requesting requesting the service uh, from the IMS framework. That's step number one. Step number two is basically requesting the radio resources from the radio access network to uh, allow that service to happen. Then having some authorization, service authorization in the network to, allow, to, to authorize for the use of the, of, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the service uh, that is being requested and to authorize for the radio resources that are being uh, claimed from the network and then in the end, once everything matches and if you, what you're requesting is what you're really authorized for, then we get uh, basically uh, your media session established. So these are simple five steps that summarizes how you establish a simple session. So we saw uh, in, in, in summary, there is interaction between the user to the IMS network, there is an interaction here, the user to the radio access network, that's another interaction, and there is some gluing between both of them through these, uh, these three and four, basically for uh, authorizing that, that service, basically having the IMS controlling the bearers, the, the IP and the radio bearers. This is called service bearer control, where the service is really controlled, the, the radio and the IP bearers. The bearers means that the, 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 the transporting mechanism. So, 
we saw, we, we talked a little bit about the triple A's being the policy servers that uh, basically manage the underlying networks, manage the, 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 the underlying IP network, and manage the, uh, and manage, uh, the, the, the radio access network. And the PCRF was the gluing element or the policy server that allows services to control these underlying two, uh, two underlying networks. So what does it do? It really authorizes the quality of service, uh, the, the, the quality of service level for your uh, for your request from a service perspective, and signals that down to these two networks. If it needs to be updated, say you uh, you acquired more bandwidth for some reason, the network load reduced, it updates that. If you run out of quota, it terminates your session, and so on. So it has control over that bearer. And it also, furthermore, supplies the charging rules that are relevant to your service. So that's, it's, it's much more aware than the, just the simple AAA who just statically knows this bandwidth and that's it. That is just based on your subscription. So let's see this parental control application that is based on our uh, communication magazine's article in the September issue. So th this application is simply having a parent, her name is Sarah, and Sarah wants to restrict uh, her, her child Bob from calling his friend Johnny during school time. And only after school time, Bob is allowed to make the calls to Johnny. And furthermore, she restricts the quality of service for the video to be 32 kilobits per second. She doesn't want to pay much for, you know, for, uh, for the video access. So she wants to uh, limit uh, the options that Bob has. So to do that, uh, she configures basically the, uh, the access rules using a web portal. And these access rules get, get saved uh, basically in, uh, in, in, uh, into the network, basically in, the, in her HSS profile, and configures these rules that will go to the application server, as, as I just mentioned uh, in a few slides ago, uh, about how, how this uh, requ call request will be treated. So what happens when Bob wants to make a call? When Bob wants to make a call, uh, Bob simply sends an, uh, a SIP invitation request. This SIP invitation request is re received by Johnny. This simply triggers some uh, basically some authentication and authorization through, interac through interaction between uh, the policy control and charging function and uh, the application servers and the, uh, the, the call switching, uh, call session control functions in the network. So it's, it just authorizes you for that service. And then afterwards, what happens is uh, some, some similar authorization takes place on Johnny's side. We're not showing Johnny's side. Afterwards, what happens is that the Bob starts requesting these resources from the radio access network in parallel. And then the resources will, the, the request will be pushed from the radio access network to the IP network. Once the IP network, the, the, this PDSN receives all your authorization information from uh, it, it knows already your subscription profile from the AAA, and once it receives it from the, the policy control and charging function here, it's going to authorize for your service. And then if you're authorized, your session, your media session will be established. A better picture, I have a clearer picture than this in the next slide, but this is just to show the steps that all what you really need to do is basically send the request Authorize for that request, request for, from the radio network, compare your authorization from the service level, the radio level, they match, boom, session is established. That's uh, as simple as it is. But it actually, it involves many, many, many steps because we're talking about signaling on three networks. So this is, again, a simple recap of the previous, uh, of the previous signaling that I showed on the picture. And this is more or less. Um, SIP signaling that we're all familiar with. So this is the invitation message that I talked about. And this basically triggers the service information, some service authorization information coming from the proxy call session control function because it receives your, uh, your invitation request and pushes that service information to the, the, the policy control and charging function Now for, for this side. We have two, uh, now we have two options. Once I receive it, uh, I receive this service uh, information uh, at the PCRF. I could simply push it to the PDSN directly to the access gateway, or I just can hold on it. Maybe because what if this, uh, the call uh, request doesn't complete? I don't want to reserve more resources in the network. So what happens afterwards is that 
th this pro provisional acknowledgement that we're all familiar with will trigger will trigger a radio access request, radio bearer request or reservation from the radio access network. We'll try to acquire the radio resources for the session from the network. And that's through EVDO or access technology specific uh, reservations. In EVDO, there is a procedure to request that. In UMTS, there is another procedure. So that's the procedure, the reservation procedure that would take place in the, in the radio network. Once that completes, you're, uh, you're done here on Bob's side. But since, for, for example, on John's side, the, the PDSN doesn't know yet about your authorization from the service perspective, through, when it receives your EVDO bearer, uh, bearer reservation request, when, when you're claiming the radio resources, what happens is that the PDSN will contact the PCRF and ask it, hey, I, I'm receiving a service request uh, for, for, that, uh, for, for that quality of service. Is he authorized? The PCRF may have the full information already from that step, so it may not need actually to contact the PCSCF or application services. And it may not, for some reason, may need more information depending on the requesting PDSN. Maybe for, you're restricted in certain regions. You're, you have some restrictions based on where you're accessing that service at. So it may and may not do that. Once you're authorized, you confirm the service, and then you continue with the standard SIP signaling with, pre, this is called SIP with preconditions, actually, for telecommunication networks. You update and continue with the uh, ringing and uh, acknowledgments. There is a part here that is, uh, that is basically, once you receive this provisional acknowledgment here after the ringing message, you, there is a trigger that comes from the, uh, uh, the, the, the proxy call session control function down to the, to the PDSN, and down to the PDSN and through the PCRF here. And that request instructs, instructs the network, the IP network, from the service. You see this, this is the, the IMS, and this is basically the service really having, is basically in charge. And it's not only the PCSCF, because this is just an illustration figure. Could be your application server, your Google's application server. Yes, sir. So assuming that you have your application server and your proxy must send the, all the parameters from the invite to your application server, how do you ensure that, for instance, I will receive the location of the uh, uh, MT initiating a call? Is there any specific protocol? Is there any standardized extension? Let's say that Google wants to deploy an application which will be aware of the location of the place where the call is originated. What, what kind of So the question is, how would, how would during this uh, call setup procedure, how would this PCSCF or application server know the location of, of, the, of the handset uh, uh, basically to establish the service? There is, uh, there is a lot of work actually going on to today about with, the presence, uh, uh, with the presence servers. And in that region, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of actually, there is a lot of standardization that is taking place to acquire the service through the pre uh, presence platform. But I will not get access to the presence server because this is something which the telecommunication provider will keep for themselves. I would understand that in a, I will have extra parameters added to the original invite message, right? Because I, cannot, this, I will not get access to the location information of all the cell phones. Uh, true. Actually, this was one of actually the, it is a very interesting point, actually. It's, mo it's how to deploy IMS. We had actually a IMS uh, workshop last, uh, last summer in Greece. And that was one of the main things, actually, with these application servers, even interacting with your uh, database uh, as well, the, your HSS or your, your presence information. Again, the solution to that is, uh, as I'm aware of, is not there in the standardization bodies yet. But it really depends on the SLAs that you have. You may even end up having some application server like brokering between, between, between you and the provider during uh, the, the setup stage. Did I answer the question, or? Yes, so there would be like a custom proprietary. Some broker, provide. yes, some broker application server to, to, to basically uh, isolate you from directly accessing user-specific information, only giving you the specific parameters that you need. So pretty much it means that only big players can deploy services which are really rich in new features. Because if you are a small startup company and you want to do something by yourself, you will never reach the SLA on the signalization level with 
any provider giving you such information because they will tell you that this is a privacy issue, that they will not. Actually, th this is uh, contrary. This is a very interesting question here. But the whole point is actually that providers uh, or third parties here uh, get into the play by just maybe owning this application server here. There was a nice startup company from Holland that was just doing uh, SMS, uh, some next generation SMS services, and they only owned their application servers there, and they wanted to interact with the providers. And the whole discussion that triggered was they wanted some access to the home subscriber subsystem directly, and the question that popped up, oh, how come you're gonna just immediately access my Providers, the users' database. You could just simply just even you know like do uh, just search everything and get more information than what you really need. So uh, the, the answer to that maybe through some brokering or through uh, the brokering. So you 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 basically uh, isolate them from directly accessing the information that they don't need to have. That's a very interesting question. So. Uh, again, this is an excellent question, actually, because it really gets us to the, the issue, actually, of, the, of even this presentation. The whole point that I'm making about the challenge and quality of service is that, OK, all of these guys are trying to get into play and make, you know, and, and basically deploy these services. This means that there is really, you cannot control things by standardization in terms of the delay that will basically, uh, the, how long will it take really to get this information. Suppose that this service composed of many uh, collaborating or federating uh, providers, small providers to complete uh, the service. One is managing lo your location, another one is managing the number of your calls and et cetera. A simple example that just comes into mind. Yeah, well, my point is that 20 years ago there was TCAP, TCAP query was yes. to replace and fix all of those issues. Now we have an extension to the SIG, but it doesn't really exist yet in the form of a specification, and we are again Yes, there, the, the, actually that was, at that time they had this Tina C, uh, Tina C, which was really ahead of its time, but unfortunately because we were not prepared for it, it didn't really fly. And IMS is really based on these principles more or less, but really taking uh, over all the powers from IP and from SIP that is really very successful, two very successful technologies, and just pushing it. So just to show just a little bit of how complicated it is from the radio perspective, things are uh, basically if you receive, that's from the radio plane perspective. So how the radio basically, how you uh, reserve quality of service on the, uh, uh, from the radio per level, this is the downlink or the, from the base station to the, the radio network, to, to the user. So you receive your packets here, and these are basically the filtering rules that tells, there are filtering rules that are uh, provisioned at the, uh, at, the, at the PDSN, at that IP, IP node here. Well, here's the PDSN, that PDSN that was provisioned with these rules from the PCRF during this call setup. So these rules will instruct the PDSN on how to separate traffic and between who and who. So it will separate traffic using simple, it looks like simple access lists actually that are dynamically provided to the PDSN. It separates traffic and this traffic is separated at the PDSN level and again mapped to something, to tunnels between the PDSN and the radio network controller because the radio network controller, unfortunately I, I only have RAN here, but the radio network controller is simply, um, doesn't understand IP so is that, that's why we tunnel it into these uh, so-called A10 tunnels and then once this traffic is forwarded, it will go down and get mapped again to the radio, uh, uh, radio link protocol flows, basically, and the, which goes down to, 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 to the user. So it's really complicated, and this is just a simplifica simplification of how things go. <laughs> so enforcing quality of service really means that we want to enforce quality of service at all, in all layers, in the IP network and in the radio network. This is, and we signal that on three levels, at the radio network level, at the IP level, and from the service level. Okay, so the challenges that I just mentioned in the very beginning of uh, our talk here today is the post-dial delay challenge, the handoff uh, delay, and uh, the quality of service profile unification. So, uh, the, the challenge is really with the post-dial delay. The game there is basically, b b because we have this very long 
uh, so many, we have so many messages. It's not, it, it takes a long, quite a long time to establish the call, about 10 seconds in today's uh, networks, um, from today's network's perspective. The game to optimize it is really based on two things, two main, two main things. The first one, on how fast I can acquire the, the radio access network, and I will explain why shortly. The second thing is reducing the message sizes that I'm exchanging with the, with the, with the radio network. So two things, how fast I can acquire and the message sizes. We optimize these two, we minimize the, uh, the, the call setup time. So this is once one of the measurements and tests we've done, I've done with uh, Sprint Nextel, um, with our collaboration with Sprint Nextel. And this is mainly based on reducing the call setup delay through optimizing radio network parameters and optimizing SIP. Optimization of radio network parameters is really, because your handset is not on all the time, it goes dormant, it releases the, the, the radio resources uh, as, as you're not using it, because it doesn't want to keep reserving very expensive bandwidth. That's how most of radio networks work. So to, do, to, to basically, when you want to initiate a call, what this means really is uh, you want to reestablish that traffic channel with the radio network, and then send, uh, send your initial messages. On, this, on the receiving side, the, the handset is not there yet, and it needs to check whether it's having any message or not. That's periodically checking the, what's so, the so-called paging channel. So the whole game is about really acquiring, uh, really minimizing that time. So there, is, there are mechanisms from in, in the EVDO network called enhanced control channel where you can acquire control very quickly. It saves us about 100 milliseconds from the current nine seconds delay. And uh, doing some data, sending data or data packets over the signaling channels over the control channels that are always alive that, that you don't release normally. So we use these two to send the first invitation message. So we save about uh, 370 milliseconds. On the receiving side, there are f about five seconds. Every five seconds max, you keep checking whether you received a message or not, whether you received an invitation or not. So it may take you, on average, two and a half seconds, the average of this five, to basically to figure out whether you received a call or not. So we minimize, we reduce that actually to this 426 uh, millisecond cycle. Okay, it will, it will be at the expense of the battery lifetime, but that's the best we can do. And then this basically ended up reducing, killing about three seconds out. So that's you just simply by using and acquiring how fast we can acquire the radio channel. On the other hand, we wanted to play a little bit with SIP by reducing the SIP content. Not all the STP content is, uh, is really needed by, by, by the radio network. We kicked out some of it, some header information, and that really reduced up to 5.4 seconds. And then the real, our real target was four seconds from the ITU E771 standard. That's the, the standard for uh, national calls, and that's what we were testing for. So to do that, we wanted to be a little more optimistic about the call establishment. We said, okay, we will do aggressive signaling by saying, we will assume that the radio network will always establish its call. So if we make this assumption, we don't have to wait for the radio network confirming its, uh, its, uh, uh, its reservation, the establishment of the call, and, making, and sending the ring uh, tone immediately to the, to the sender. And the, uh, to, to, to the sender. So that, uh, that may end up actually having some ghost rings, basically, if the other side didn't really establish. So that's the trade-off of it. To look at things uh, more of like uh, in, in a chart perspective and how things uh, work really, the, the same results of, of the table but per message. So the invitation message is clearly the worst one because it's a little large, number one, and it really involves accessing the network for the first time and establishing the data, ch the, the traffic channels. So this is really where most of the radio optimizations really were really beneficial to us. At, for, for this invitation message, mainly, because it's the first message we're sending. And the SIP and the size of the messages for these little large messages, because they carry some SDP inside them, we, uh, we basically benefited from that by these amounts, uh, by these uh, pink amounts uh, over the air interface. 
Further challenges here, I just uh, want to be a little quick about it. Uh, this uh, quality of service profile, we want to unify our quality of, uh, uh, of service. We have two uh, policy managing servers, the AAA and the PCRF. We want to unify both of them, and we want to reduce the amount to take a handoff. How does that happen? Currently, we have this AAA managing the PDSN and the radio network controller, and we have this PCRF talking and managing uh, the, the policies from the service perspective. We want to reduce this uh, com management overhead, actually, and have only a single quality of service profile. So what we do, really, is have the PCRF, basically, our, as our managing uh, policy management profile kick out that AAA functionality, and have the currently, as I mentioned in the very beginning, the IMS is really a service agnostic uh, network. And Using this, uh, if we want to have some, some network-specific parameters that the AAA used to handle, this means that we want to introduce, this is controversial, uh, controversial of course, some, uh, uh, some network-specific parameters or profile uh, for each network inside this HSS. So whenever you want to authenticate from an eVDO network, I get this configuration-specific information from the HSS, pushed it down to the, uh, to the uh, PCRF, and this will configure both your PDF and uh, your RNC for your, uh, your, your network setup phase. So that was one of the things, but again, it's controversial because some other people will tell you, okay, I would like to maintain this separation as much as possible. I don't want to maintain multiple profiles. But uh, the, the, the benefit of that is reducing the management hassle and conflicts. So that was one of the things that we proposed, actually, for quality of service uh, profile unification. The other challenge is really for an established session. For an established session, if, if you're removing user inside the network, it will take, actually, quite a long time as you move between PDSN regions. Just to show that in this, uh, in this diagram here, you're connected through here through that call setup that, that I just showed. And as you move from one area to another to another, the same signaling takes place. You want to authorize. This PDSN doesn't share necessarily context with the previous one. So it needs to authorize you again uh, to figure out uh, with, the, with your uh, PCRF to grab your service specific quality of service profile to figure out you know, uh, who you are and whether you're authorized or not. And again, it may do that with application servers as well. So if, if you're making a call and you're walking with it, this means service interruption. This means uh, voice call interruption. That's, and that's really like very, very annoying, much more annoying than the post-dial delay. And as you move even between operator regions here, between your home network and another roaming operator or an alliance with, uh, with, uh, with the home network, this will require having their PCRF talk to your home PCRF here to authorize you at your home network because it doesn't know you or have your profile. And uh, your, their AAA talking to your home AAA authorizing for, you know, the, uh, at, at its level, at the AAA level. So that takes quite a long time. So the solution to that was through simply uh, what we proposed is really pre-authenticating. Before you really move here, we predict that you're going to be moving whether you're, if you become on the bordering cell, if you're on the border between uh, two networks, then we trigger uh, sending, uh, uh, pre-authenticating you with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with your home operator so you won't have to do this signaling when you really want to hand off. So that's the whole idea. The, 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 this is kind of different from current attempts. We were the first actually to propose pre-authentication to IMS. This is different from uh, the current attempts to optimize pre-authentication for, uh, for mobile IP, which is taking place today in today's, uh, uh, a lot in, today, in the IETF a lot today. Because the, we have this variability, actually going back to the same question that we had, there might be so many providers giving you this service, and it might t take a lot, quite a long time, actually, to, you know, to, to acquire the service. So we, we do this pre-authentication pre to save uh, ourselves from that. So uh, what, what, uh, the, the simple idea is basically once you authenticate and you establish your session right before it, we send uh, the, 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 the time that is required for authentication down to the AAA server. And the AAA server, once your, your session starts, forwards that to your radio network controller because it, it really sees and knows which cells you are in. So it, it knows how, if you're handing off soon or not. So once you're really about to hand off here, 
It, the, the, the radio network controller will send the hand of imminent message up to the AAA, and from the AAA, the AAA will send a not, uh, the, the, the expected target PDSN up to the PCRF, the, the, the PCRF telling it, uh, hey, the user is about to hand off to this target PDSN, pre-authenticate him there. So this PCRF uh, immediately forwards this information, like acquires if there is any authentication with the application servers, and pushes that information to the PDSN even before you're there. Uh, so that's uh, simply a pre-authenticating you there. And then once you really hand off there, when, uh, doing the same procedure as we showed with the call setup, you simply don't have to do this IMS authentication at all. So we did it right before, your, uh, right before this mobile IP uh, signaling is taking place. We did it right before you come. The idea and the clean thing about this approach is that it takes, we only used policy servers, policy, the policy framework to bypass these triggers. We didn't use, we didn't need to uh, introduce any other components. So the, the policy framework is what, what really ended up uh, forwarding these triggers from one component to, to another. And that's the, the novelty of our approach here. Another, the final challenge I wanted to talk about is if we have multiple networks, multiple bearers in, in our network, UMTS, WiMAX, EVDO, we may, we, we're imagining in the future some situations where I want to break up my session if I'm in a, engaged in a voice video call over eVDO, which has quite a narrow bandwidth compared to WiMAX, right? So uh, if I hit WiMAX, I can keep my VoIP stream connected to eVDO in order to avoid interrupting the, the current session and split the service in, with, with, with the WiMAX. So this service splitting doesn't exist in today's, in today's semantics. So that's one thing that we're working on currently. The lesson learned finally about, uh, uh, about uh, the, 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 this whole, from this whole research is that it's, it's not really that simple, actually, to deploy services. Quality of services really needs to be integrated into the network and re really needs to be part of, uh, of our original design of the, of the network. Uh, we need to, uh, to, to consider things from an end-to-end -end approach. We don't need to just design things haphazardly. And uh, optimizations are necessary at, at, each, at each tier in the network. They're not uh, necessary. You, you cannot do uh, optimizations uh, just in the RAN and leave the other parts. You have to have a comprehensive picture, especially as an application developer. You, you really have to expect these interruptions. You have to understand what's, what, what's happening, uh, what's the underlying things that are really happening inside the network. And more sophisticated things that will happen in the future, as I just mentioned, splitting services and these kinds of things, you really have to be aware of what's happening there, whether you're accessing WiMAX, EVDO, and what are the semantics of the underlying networks uh, uh, that are taking place. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate my, very much your time, and I uh, welcome any questions. Would it be possible to use GPS to optimize some of the handoffs between cells? If you could tell where somebody was and how fast they were traveling, what cell they had yes. towards? Definitely. I recently, actually, through the the, the 802 uh, the 80221 standard, this uh, uh, media independent handoffs, uh, people were proposing actually using location-based uh, predict uh, predictivity through GPS. The issue actually is uh, there are many many issues actually with GPS today. I, w I was just listening to a workshop in. Um, uh, in the last conference, this uh, consumer electronics conference, CCNC in Las Vegas, people were talking about the accuracy of your GPS uh, fixes, they're called fixes, where you're acquiring or uh, basically acquiring information from the network. And there are some locations that it's, it becomes very hard to uh, to, 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 to acquire the, the, the exact information about where you're exactly located. It's possible, but people are still working on it. The most dominant thing today is really your signal-to-noise ratio. But definitely, there is a lot of room about it. I've seen uh, something with uh, people using TV signals uh, to, 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 to locate you to do the triangularization. So th that's, that's a very cool application of it. And I think that in the future, GPS will be the probably one of the things, one of the ways to go about this predicting, uh, about accurately predicting an imminent handover. That's, uh, that's definitely uh, one of the things that are highly considered today.
Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I guess uh, QoS for telecom networks are important, but I guess IMS, uh, IMS uh, particularly, I guess, go one step further because it actually uh, use, uh, you know, correlate this with uh, application. So I guess there's been concern about what this to do with uh, net neutrality, for example. So do you have any comment on that? Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the last yeah, basically the net neutrality because potentially the telecom, the, the ISP providers, uh, the wireless providers, they can basically, you know, control the traffic in a certain way to, I don't know, benefit whatever their business based on the content and the application as opposed to just generally based on the oh, okay. condition okay. of the network and the users. So this is a very important issue if I uh, understood the, qu the question quite well. So w it's more about differentiating the, the, the services rather than, rather than thinking of uh, th considering services as just uh, flat, uh, flat IP based. Is that, uh, yeah, is that uh, the part? Yeah. So definitely, definitely the whole point about IMS is basically to do this service differentiation. So when we say quality of service now, Okay, what we learn, listen, learn today. Well, it's not it's not simply uh, diff serve. It's not simply in serve models that we all study about in the books and textbooks. It's much more than that. <laughs> SIP is basically configuring uh, things for us and really configuring these the parameters for for diff serve and in serve in reality inside the IP network. Configuring the radio access network somehow to uh, to uh, uh, to basically establish the quality of service requirements for your service end to end. In inside the network. So the, the game that telecom providers are playing, they're really avoiding the, the mistake or the, 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 what happened with the regular internet service providers in deploying and really charging for the quality of service that they give to the customers through that signaling and giving them better experience. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So um, I know you all are probably hungry, so feel free to go at this point. And if anyone else has any questions for Saeed, uh, please stick around and feel free to ask those. Thank you very much.